Hello, I am Deep Dutta from New Delhi. This is the second session of learning how to do meta analysis ourselves. In the previous session, we had learned how to use the RevMan software developed by the Cochrane Group to do a meta analysis means how to generate the forest plot for the primary and secondary outcomes which we have already developed for our meta-analysis. In the previous session, we had taken the example of gemigliptin, a relatively newer anti-diabetic agent, to see how the data performs from different randomized controlled trials with regards to its efficacy and safety for managing type 2 diabetes. In the last session, we also learned how to save the forest plot, how to merge them into one or two or three figures, and how to write the manuscript of a meta-analysis, the main outcomes, the introduction, the methodology, how to look at the different risk of bias. We learned how to use the development software to make the risk of bias stable and figures, and how to write the results in terms of odds ratio or mean difference for the primary and secondary outcomes, how to get the 95% confidence interval values and the significance. Today, we shall be focusing on how to make the summary of finding tables, which specifically talks of grading of the evidence generated by a particular meta-analysis. So let me share the screen now. Yeah, so we are going to the published meta-analysis on efficacy and safety of gemagliptin in the management of type 2 diabetes. So for any standard meta-analysis, it's a very, very set protocol. First, we write the introduction of why we are doing this meta-analysis. We highlight the PICOS criteria, what were the strict criteria for study selection, the inclusion and the exclusion criteria, what sort of people are being evaluated and what are main outcomes of a study. Then we talk of how we did the literature search from where, which all database we searched to look for the RCTs to be included in our meta-analysis. Then we make a table. Table one is always very important where we mention the key salient features of all the RCTs which have been included in your meta-analysis. And then you may have a table two, uh, which is optional, which is usually not present. While searching your literature, you may have excluded some RCTs. So you, if you have space or time, uh, you can make a table two showing what all studies you excluded and mention why, what were the reasons for exclusion for those studies from your meta-analysis that makes the meta-analysis more holistic. And the third table, which is perhaps the most important table, what, which is how to make which, that we are going to learn today. It is the summary of finding tables, which in a nutshell mentions the top seven key outcomes of your meta-analysis in simple layman language. And if you see here, there's a last column here, which talks of the grading of the evidence. So it may be high, it may be moderate, it may be low. In this meta-analysis, there was nothing low. So by grading means, when you say it's a high grade of evidence, means the results which you have generated in your meta-analysis that is very, very likely to be replicated in the real world scenario in your day-to-day -day practice. If the evidence is moderate, which is three plus and not four plus, it means that there's a good chance of, being, of it being replicated in your day-to-day -day practice, but sometimes it may not be replicated. If it is low, means, sorry, the results which we have generated from our meta-analysis, that is of dubious nature, it may not, and most likely it is difficult to replicate the same in our day-to-day -day practice. So it's very important to know the quality of results from a meta-analysis. Now let us look at the other key features of the summary of finding table. It has the key outcomes. Of course, here we have seven outcomes by more than seven outcomes. Conventionally, it is recommended, recommended to include the top seven outcomes of your meta analysis, which is going to interest the reader of the journal or the audience in general. So, if you look here, I have highlighted in yellow the outcomes of the placebo control group. We remember in this meta analysis, we had two subgroups. In one subgroup, the performance of gemagliptin as the anti diabetic agent was compared to placebo, which is the PCG or it was compared to any other pure anti-diabetic medication, what we call the active control group or ACG. If you look at the highlighted yellow part, HB1C reduction at 24 weeks, it talks of the mean HB1C values in the control group, which was 8.27%. So in this scenario, when you use gemagliptin instead of a placebo, we will have an average of 
additional 0.9% lowering of HbA1c and the 95% confidence interval says it, it ranges from minus 1.18 to minus 0.63 means in the best case scenario, the HbA1c lowering may be as high as minus 1.18% and in the worst case scenario, it may be as high as minus 0.63%. And since both these values are on the left side of zero, it is not crossing the midline, we call it a statistical significant observation. And this data was generated from four RCTs having 856 odd individuals and the grade of evidence is very high, it means yes, this is good evidence. We will be able to replicate such a good performance of generative in our day-to-day -day practice also. If you look at the first row, it talks of HbA1c reduction of gemiglyptin as compared to other anti diabetic agents, that's why it is the ECG or active control group. And here, what we see, the mean reduction of HbA1c, the mean difference was only 0.09% higher. So, it is actually slightly higher with gemiglyptin as compared to the pure anti diabetic agents. But was it statistically significant? You look at the 95% confidence interval and it ranges from 0.06% lower, which is minus 0.06% of HbA1c to the worst case scenario, it may go as high as plus 0.23% HbA1c. So since this 95% confidence interval of the best case scenario to worst case scenario crosses the midline or zero, it is not a statistical significant observation. And how we interpret it? Basically, we say gemiglyptin performs as good as any other anti-diabetic agent because the difference between the two groups was very marginal, only 0.09%. And that too, the confidence interval was crossing to zero. So it is not different. And this data was generated from two randomized control trials with 556 odd patients. And what is the grade of evidence? It is, pretty, it is moderate. So it's most likely to be replicated a pretty strong data in a day-to-day -day practice, but it is not as strong as the data which we saw when the, we generated the data from the placebo control group of the TCG. So we are going to learn today how to make this beautiful table. If you come down there, this also talks of adverse events, the total or the severe adverse events, where the values they mention in events per thousand population. So if you look at the total adverse events, for every thousand people taking placebo, 420 people had some form of adverse event. But if the patient was taking gemiglyptin, it was 434. It was very marginal. The odds ratio was only 1.06. And again, if you look at the evidence, it comes from a very strong evidence from 11 different RCTs of more than 1700 patients. So yes, gemiglyptin is very well tolerated. So now we are back to our Ravman sheet. We have all the last session we had already made our Ravman sheet where it did all the analysis. So let, let us summarize again. Whenever we open the Ravman file, we start with the title page and then come the studies and references. If you click here, if you can see the included studies and the excluded studies, we have already en entered it during the last session, both the included and excluded studies. We had, once we do that, a separate set of rows open up for each studies. We had entered the risk of bias. All the information we got from the individual RCTs, with the, pub the published RCTs. Then we went to the data analysis. Uh, we analyzed gemiglyptin 50 milligrams with control group. And so that's the most commonly used dose in clinical practice. If you click on this, left click, we, we generated all the so many different variables. So, and we entered the data separately for the active control group and passive control group for both the gemiglyptin and the control, if you see here. We entered the mean value, the standard deviation, the total number of patients in the study, each of the arms in each of the studies. And we generated individual forest plots, each with which we had saved separately and made a manuscript. Today, we are going to make the summary of finding tables with the grading of the evidence. So since we have done all the analysis and it's ready with us, now what we will do is we will go online and we will log into the Grade Pro GDT. You go to our browser, we type www.gradeprogdt.org. This brings us to the Grade Pro software where we need to register first, make our username and password. It's totally free to use. 
and then we go for login. So my username and password is already saved there. So I just log into it. And here you will have all the databases available for all the summary of finding tables and grading you have done for all your meta analysis. It can be archived here indefinitely. So we are going to make the summary of finding tables again for this meta analysis. So what we do is we in, you can make a new project here by scratch. You can enter all your data, but we have done our work already. We have entered all our data into a RevMan file. So Great Pro gives the option of importing data from the RevMan file. So I click on import project. It will ask us to choose the RevMan file, which we want to include here for analysis to make the grading. And I go to the gemecliptic meta analysis folder, which I've already made. And we already have the RevMan file. I just click, double click on it and I go for next. So it will ask, we had made three questions for the three dose of gemagliptin, but we are analyzing the full dose of gemagliptin with controls. We select only the first question and then it asks us, should we import the project? And we say yes. So the great post software now uploads to itself all the work we have done on RevMan. So we did not repeat it. It saves us a lot of time. So the question comes here, should gemagliptin 50 milligram versus control be used in the management of type 2 diabetes? So the question, yes, so we need not add a question. And if I double click on it, if you see here for all the different outcomes we had done analysis, it generates on its own the summary of finding tables. But we know we can't have so many rows in the summary of finding tables. So one by one, we are going to delete each of it. So we are going to keep the top seven or eight key findings, which are going to have in your final table. So there are so many things. Many of the parameters has only one study. So you can go to the side of the screen. You can click the delete option and whatever extra data is here, which you don't need in your final, final summary of finding table. You just keep on deleting them one by one till you have the final five or seven rows. So we have trimmed the original table which we had imported from RevMan to our grade pro GDT. So we are looking at grading the evidence for HbA1c reduction at 24 weeks for both the active control group as, and as well as the placebo control group here. And we are looking at the odds ratio for total adverse events. This 54 weeks data was not there, just for learning purposes that we had made for the last presentation. So three main parameters we are looking at, total adverse events and HPA events reduction. Now we already, the great pro software does give us some basic information. If you look at the total adverse event, it, it gives us the values per thousand population, both in the control group, as well as compared to people receiving gemagliptin. And you get an odds ratio value also. And if you see the range of odds ratio, it ranges from 0.82 in the best case scenario. to the worst case scenario as high as 1.36. And since it crosses one, it's statistically not significant. And this comes from 11 studies from a cohort of 1,792 patients. Now, this is the certainty column, which would have, which should give us ideally the four plus three plus or two plus or one plus as a strong grade or moderate or low grade evidence. So the software needs some more information from us. So it needs some more information regarding the number of participants in the studies, the nature of the studies. If you left click on this box, it asks for study design. Since we have included only randomized controlled trials, this is a meta-analysis, we select randomized controlled trials for all the different parameters we choose to include in our summary of finding tables. So I'm doing it for the three main outcomes which, I'm, which we are going to include in our summary of finding table today. Next, if you click, click on the certainty box, you see a lot of missing information. If you see the bottom three 
rows, it asks for large effect, plausible confounding, and those respond gradient. They are inherently no because we have taken only randomized control trials. Had we been doing a systematic review of observational studies or case control studies, then we would have forced to include, evaluate in each of the studies these three factors and enter accordingly yes or no. But for us, it is no because we have just taken RCTs. But there are still a lot of vacant rows we need to enter the correct information so that the software can give us the actual grade for these outcomes which we are looking into. The first question is the risk of bias. Is it not serious, serious or very serious? So we had in the last session, we had calculated and made the risk of bias table. For a moment, let me stop sharing this and let's go back to the risk of bias table. So this is the risk of bias a table. If you see for different studies here, all the different RCTs which we have included. If you see for predominantly the seven different risk of bias we have looked into, they are largely green, which is low risk of bias. Only for studies like Park et al., Re et al., and Young et al. For allocation, concealment, we are not very clear about the risk of bias. And predominantly the other bias which looks into the pharmaceutical funding that is red or high risk because most of these studies were funded by the pharma industry except for the study by Cho et al. published in 2020. So since majority of them have low risk of bias, for all our parameters, we are going to select low risk of bias in our Grade Pro GDT table. So let's go back and select it's not serious for all the different parameters. So I'm clicking on the box under certainty, the left click. I go to the risk of bias and select not serious for all the three parameters which we have included. We have chosen to include in our summary of findings table. The next set of questions is inconsistency. Well, none of our data are inconsistent and, not, and we don't have imprecision because we had looked at the attrition bias. They were low in all the studies and for inconsistency, we look at the I square or the heterogeneity of the data analysis. So for that, let's go back and look at the I square data or the heterogeneity of the data for HBA1 reduction at 24 weeks for active and placebo control group and total adverse events. So yes, let's go back to our Word document, our manuscript, which we have written. We look at the result section. If you see here, uh, we have the HBA1C reduction for the placebo control group and the active control group. You have the mean difference values. We have the p-value, which is significant because there's significant lowering of HBA1C with gemagliptin as compared to placebo control group. And we have the I-square value, which is low heterogeneity. Similarly, when we look at the outcomes of gemagliptin compared to active control group, we have the mean difference value, which is marginal, the p-value, which is not significant, and the i square continues to be 0% if it's low heterogeneity. Now let's move on to the safety section of our manuscript, where we had mentioned the occurrence of total adverse events was not significantly different in people receiving gemagliptin as compared to the overall control group. The risk ratio was only 1.06. We have the 95% confidence interval, and the p-value is not significant, and the i square continues to be 35% which is less than 60%, so it is low heterogeneity. So hence, we go back to our great pro GDT table and we select the inconsistency as not serious, imprecision as not serious. And same, we select here, it is not serious and imprecision as not serious. And for the third parameter also, we do the same. It is not serious and imprecision is not serious. Now we have two more questions to answer. One is indirectness. There is no indirectness in our study because we have taken only data from randomized control trials. So this also continues to be not serious in our meta analysis. So we, we select not serious. The last question which remains to be answered is the publication bias. So by publication bias, the Great Pro GDT software wants to know from us that 
all the literature we have included in our analysis has the data distribution been really homogeneous in them so the concept of publication bias comes from the fact that whenever we do some study we are randomized control trials studies which tend to show positive results they tend to get published the studies which tend to show negative results or no results they are not very attractive so many times although these studies are done they do not get published so there are statistical tools like funnel plot we will plot funnel plot and if you see that the distribution of data is uniformly distributed under the funnel it is assumed that there is no publication bias all sorts of studies with different variability of results have been published so to answer the last question we need to again go back to our revman software our revman sheet so let me share the revman sheet again for us and here we see here we have all the analysis which we have done for different parameters the section called figures you do a right click on figures they ask a question add figures we had used this option to make the risk of bias graph at risk of bias summary in a previous session now we are going to make a funnel plot and we are going to make funnel plot for the variables which we have chosen to include in our summary of findings table so we have included the hba1c reduction at 24 weeks we take this and we put it here and we finish it so now we have the funnel plot in front of us so if you see there is a center line in the middle and there is a data going towards the left side and there is data going towards the right side now we have three studies we have one study in the midline and we have two studies almost equidistantly distributed on the either side so we consider that the distribution is equivocal and symmetrical across the midline so if you draw a funnel it would be a symmetric funnel so we call that the publication bias risk is low risk when we look at the when we compare gemagliptin outcomes with the active control group so we need to save this funnel plot we do a double click you click the save option and it you can save it as a svg file or you can save it as a picture as a png file i typically save as a svg file and i save it as funnel plot for hb a1c and in the active control group in my gemagliptin meta-analysis folder as same thing so let us similarly draw another figure again we are drawing a funnel plot and we are drawing it for hba1c now in the placebo control group so now let's search for hba1c in the placebo control group from all the entire list here we have hba1c 24 weeks placebo control group and we click next chair and we click finish and you have the funnel plot now if you see you actually cannot make a funnel here we have four studies one study tends to be on the midline and two studies on the right side of the midline and one on the left we really can't make a straight funnel with this since we can't do it we call that the distribution is skewed if you try to make a funnel forcibly two of the studies will fall this study and this study will fall outside the funnel so here we assume that there is a significant publication bias and hence not all the studies are fitting into the funnel which we are trying to draw on either side of the midline it's an inverted funnel like this we are not able to draw it so we are going to enter high publication bias for gemagliptin hba1c reduction at 24 weeks when compared to the placebo control group so i do double left click i get the save option i save it this time i save it as funnel plot or HbA1c placebo control group and lastly we will need to draw a funnel plot for total adverse events so I click the next let's search for total adverse event among all the different outcomes here we can get it the total adverse events and we click next and click finish and now you get a picture like this so now if you see here we have a lot of studies all the 11 studies if you see the three studies are close to midline 
three studies are far off from the midline on the right hand side but one two three four studies four to five studies are on the left side and again we really cannot draw a symmetrical plot funnel plot because some of the studies if you try to make an inverted funnel like this also one or two studies will be left outside so with such an asymmetrical distribution we call that the risk the publication bias risk is high as a rule of thumb if for the studies which are not touching the midline equal number of studies should be on the either side of the midline to call a symmetrical distribution to be able to draw a symmetrical funnel so for total adverse events also the publication bias is significant we do double left click and we click the save option and you save it as funnel plot for total adverse events because we need to submit the merged funnel plot as a part of supplementary figures for review purposes before at the time of consideration for publication so we have got the publication bias so let's now go back to our original great for GT, gdt sheet and we click left click and we go for publication bias for hba was reduction at 24 weeks for the active control group it was undetected because we were able to draw a symmetrical funnel but for placebo control group and total adverse events there was significant publication bias because we could not draw a symmetrical funnel the studies were not equally distributed on either side of the midline so now we have selected a significant strongly suspected publication bias we need to add an explanation and table also it asks automatically ask a question to click on this add an explanation now and you go to the note of explanation click on it again to provide the explanation there is no explanation there so you add a new explanation you write in the text box why is it high since significant publication bias present as per funnel plot and you measure check supplementary figure one which would be the all the merged funnel plots and you save it so the explain and you apply it and now you see you get four plus because we have lost points for the significant publication bias for hb was reduction 24 weeks in the placebo control group for hb was reduction at 24 weeks in the active control group it's strong very strong evidence because that we did not lose points at for any of the scores for total adverse event also we select that this strongly suspected publication of bias again it will ask us to add an explanation you click on it go on the note of exclamation and we have the same explanation for both you select the explanation and you save it so now your grade pro gdt table is complete you have got the scores high risk the sorry the grading of evidence is very strong for hba was reduction with gemagliptin as compared to the active control group and the grading of evidence is continues to be moderately strong for hba was reduction at 24 weeks in the placebo control group and for the total adverse event one thing which still remains is that for continuous variables we have not entered the mean values so you entered go to the control it asks for the mean value of HB1C in the active control group and the placebo control group, which cannot be zero. You click here, you select, we have used mean throughout our studies, we have not used range of medians, we select mean, and you put the unit here for now, its percentage. Similarly for this, you need to put the mean, the value we are going to enter, and the percent. Now we get to, we need to have the mean value of HB1C among the controls in the active control group and placebo control group. For this also, I think we need to go back again to our all our RCT text. So let me stop sharing this sheet for a moment. And what we have done is that we have made an Excel sheet. If you can see here, these are the five different studies including the under the active control group and the different studies including the, under the placebo control group. 
we have got i have written down the h mean hb ones in the control group for each of the studies here but we cannot just find the mean of this it would be wrong because different studies had different number of patients so we need to calculate the weighted mean of HbA1c or for that matter any other parameter you may choose to include in your summary of finding tables. So we multiply the HbA1c with the total number of patients you get a value and this you divide by the in the end the total number of patients in your entire active control group and you get the weighted mean HbA1c. Similarly, you can do the same thing, the weighted means fasting glucose or body weight or triglycerides or LDL or any parameters. The same thing you do, you calculated the weighted mean HB1C of the placebo control group. Now, in, now we know that the value is 8.27 in the placebo control group and 7.2 in the active control group. So let us go back to our Great pro GDT table which we are making for the placebo control group we enter 8.27 and for the active control group the mean was 7.24 so like this you have to do for all the different parameters you have chosen to include in your summary of finding tables so a lot of hard work does go into making the summary of finding tables once you have made the table now it's a complete table. We have no any missing variables here, no missing points. There's an option on the top right side, the side arrow, you click on this. It will ask now you want to export the summary of finding table. How would you like to save it? So we typically save it as an MS Word format. You download it and it goes to your downloads. So now let's go and open the table which we have made. This is the table which we have just made. So now there are some comments. We need not add any separate comments. You may choose to delete this section. You can trim the table, make it smaller and more concise. Like I can delete all of this because it's still there in the, my original manuscript. You can. You can merge them. And if you see here, it is self-explanatory. For HbA1c reduction at 24 weeks as compared to the active control group, gemagliptin works pretty similarly and the grade of evidence is high, it's very strong. For HbA1c reduction at 24 weeks as compared to placebo, gemagliptin is superior, it causes 0.91% reduction of HbA1c when the mean HbA1c in the control group was 8.27. So for an average HB was 8.27, when we add gemagliptin to it, we will have an additional lowering of 0.91% HB1C, which in the best case scenario may go to as high as minus 1.18% reduction in HB1C, or worst to worst case scenario, it may lower at least minus 0.63% lowering of HB1C. That's, that's how we infer from this table. And this data comes from four RCTs from 856 odd patients. And the grading of evidence is moderate. So most likely it will be replicated except in exceptional scenarios. And the same is for total adverse events. It was not increased. So, and then you can modify this table and you can copy and paste and include it into your final manuscript which before submission. This brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, the job or main objective of the previous session and today's session was to discuss the technicalities of how to use the RevMan software and the Grade Pro GDT online software for doing analysis in the generation of a meta-analysis. Perhaps one of the more important or more difficult aspects of doing a meta-analysis would be doing the literature search painstakingly at different databases ensuring that we do not miss any of the RCTs because even if we miss a single RCT that can have a great impact on the final result of the meta-analysis. So it's very easy. It just needs a time. We have to give time to these softwares. There are a lot of other different and fascinating aspects of the RevMan software which uh, we learn gradually as we keep on handling or playing with it, we give it some more time. Let me again highlight the Cochrane database, 
is a treasure trove. They have question answers to virtually each of the questions we do come across while doing meta analysis. Still, if you have any doubt while doing a meta analysis, if you have any problems using the RevMed software, you can write to me at deepdata2000 at the rate yahoo.com. D W E P D U W T A 2000 at the rate of yahoo.com. My best wishes. Bye bye.